Germany. In later, you were in the Indian Embassy in Germany as a consular or something like this. Yes. Uh, an expert in literature. You did your masters in English literature, but you have been teaching other literatures as well. Now, we, as my colleague Dr. Veer Singh mentioned, uh, this is called Bhai Veer Singh Sahita Sadhan. Veer Singh was an eminent poet, like Tagore, but again, not marketed because he was not translated. If you are not translated other languages, you remain limited to your own little community. So when Dr. Manmohan Singh became the chairman of the institute, he involved Dr. Amrik Singh, Professor Ravinder Kumar, Professor B.R. Nanda, Dr. J.S. Naki and others. And Dr. Veil Singh is among the young Turks who tried to open it up to the younger generation and to other traditions. So we arranged one good lecture every month. Last year was the 550th birth celebration of Guru Nanak Dev, who had 12 monthly lectures. First lecture was delivered by Professor B. N. Goswami on God Nanak. In the eyes of the artist, they imagine him in a different way. We imagine Guru Nanak in a different way. And Dr. Manmohan Singh presided. On this occasion, we also arranged an exhibition in our campus on the life and legacy of Guru Nanak, which was inaugurated by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And the 12th last lecture was delivered by Professor Ajit Singh Gill, Professor Emeritus in Jawaharlal Nehru University. We decided this year we should talk of the Bhakti tradition in the South. We all know Bhakti Dharavad Upji Lea Ramanand Uttar. It started in South and it Slowly and gradually, as I was Shiva Prakash, I was listening to some other lecture that how it traveled to other parts of India. This is what is going to be main theme of discussion. I was really impressed the way the poets in Kannad wrote language of the masses, not Sanskrit, and very, very simple, I mean, which appeals to your heart. It may not be classical work. But that work appealed to many people, and through their poems, they taught good values. Now, Guru Nanak was asked, when he went to Makkah, he was asked, open thy book, tell us who is great, Hindu or Muslim. His reply was very simple, Shubh karma bajo dove roi, both are useless without good action. I think this, I find, is the emphasis of most of the poems good actions, morality, and good actions. And again, our Guru Nanak said, truth is high, but higher still is truth for living. I mean, you keep on talking without practicing. And whatever little I read last night about these poets in, from Karnataka, they taught how to live good life. That's important. Not just um, giving lectures, but not living. So we thought we should devote this year to having a contact with the South. Guru Nanak visited South. There's a Gurdwara, Nanak Jira. Guru Nanak from South went to Rameshwaram and then to Sri Lanka. How come there's no reference of Guru Nanak in South Indian Bhakti? Maybe language was a barrier, I don't know. Maybe a little later we can talk. But then this is our concern to, for this purpose who invited scholars from the South to talk about Bhakti in the South India. And the next scholar who invited is Professor Muthumon, Madurai Kamraj University, One Man's Army, started Center for Guru Nanak Studies. To his good luck, Surjit Singh Barnala became the governor. Center got good funding. And now things are so changed, the center is becoming almost defunct. But we want that the dialogue between North and South should continue and similarity between teachings of Guru Nanak and the other Bhagats should be emphasized. It's very, very relevant at a time when we are getting divided into, again, on very, very chauvinistic lines. So the Bhagats taught us how to transcend boundaries. And unfortunately, whether it's India or America, 
boundaries are being recreated again to divide people. So we need wisdom from people like Professor Shiva Prakash so that we can preach the ideas of the poets and bhagats to transcend narrow boundaries and unite in a world which is universal. So with these few remarks, I request my friend Dr. Veer Singh to introduce Professor Shiva Prakash and Professor Chaudhary in absentia. I hope we can join a little later. Over to Dr. Veer Singh. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, when I was a convener of Punjabi Advisory Board of Society Academy, we organized a seminar on uh, Vachana Sahit and Gurbani at Indian, uh, Indian Institute of Languages, Mysore, in, 19, uh, in 2010. Uh, I myself found at that time that so many similarities are there between Vachana Sahit and Gurbani. And this attracted us to uh, find out a relationship between these two. Uh, uh, though there is the time difference, uh, but for the listeners of our institute by Veer Singh Sahitya Sadhan and uh, Institute of Punjab Studies, uh, I think we, uh, I should must uh, introduce Vachana Sahit. What is the Vachana Sahit? Though Professor Shiva Prakash will enlighten us with his deep knowledge, but uh, whatever I have listened, I have uh, uh, that, um, uh, tried to uh, learn about Vachana Sahit. I think that it was uh, uh, evolved in 11th century and was flourished in 12th century as part of the Sharna movement. Uh, M. Chenaya is regarded as the father of Vachana Sahit. And uh, uh, it is uh, called the uh, experience in the process of God realization. Uh, I have read somewhere that there are more than 200 uh, poets who have written Vachana Sahit, and among them, more than 30 are women poets. Uh, in the 11th or 12th century, women, more than 30 women poets are writing uh, Vachana poetry, and that is very unique. Uh, to me. Uh, Vachna uh, uh, called to the human being to give up desire and uh, for worldly wealth and ease and to live life of uh, sobriety and detachment from the world and turn to Shiva for refuge. Uh, that is the simple uh, uh, introduction to the Vachana Sahitya. And I think uh, uh, I should be thankful to my friend, Secretary Sahitya Academy, Mr. Rao, that uh, he advised us to uh, request Professor H. Siva Prakash to deliver lecture on Vachana Sahitya and uh, the relationship between Vachana Sahitya and uh, other Bhakti movement of uh, India. As told by Dr. Mahinder Singh, uh, Professor Sivaprakas is former Dean, School of uh, Arts and Aesthetics of JNU. And uh, he has very unique specializations uh, like pre-modern Indian poetics. He has worked on pre-modern Indian poetics beside uh, uh, Bhakti studies. And also he has adapted so many uh, drama. He is playwright too and a good poet also. I have listened to him uh, reciting poetry at Sahitya Academy so many times. And he is considered to be the authority on Vachana Sahitya. Uh, so I must welcome Professor Siva Prakash. Uh, Dr. Indranath Chaudhary uh, is to join us. Uh, we are waiting for him and he, as we all know, uh, Professor Indranath Chaudhary, uh, he is also an authority on comparative literature. Uh, he is well known to Punjabi listeners, Punjabi uh, writers because of Dr. Guru Bhakt Singh, Professor Chandra Mohan who are uh, in this uh, uh, that uh, center for comparative studies in India. And I know him uh, when he was secretary at uh, Sahitya Academy. And he, he was former minister and director of uh, Nehru Centre at London, Indian High Commission London, and former member secretary of uh, 
Indira Gandhi National Center for Arts. He is a great personality, and we welcome him also in his absence, and we uh, hope that he will join us soon. Uh, now, I request Professor Shiva Prakash to enlighten us with his uh, a few words. That Professor, for uh, for at least forty forty five minutes, you have forty to forty five minutes, and please uh, have your mic and uh, we welcome you, sir, again. So Welcome. I hope uh, I am audible. Clearly audible. Yeah, you are audible. You are audible. Audible. So let me begin. Uh, I was uh, given to understand I should talk about Vachana poetry in the context of Indian bhakti poetry, with special emphasis on South Indian poetry, and uh, as. Uh, Uh, Dr. Mohinder Singh has already pointed out, bhakti uh, culture began in South India. It began in Tamil Nadu in around seventh century. Then it spread to neighboring regions of Karnataka and Andhra, and then one stream went up the eastern part of India to Orissa, Bengal, and so on. Another stream up. The western part, western uh, the side of India, Maharashtra, Gujarat, and up to Punjab, and then Kashmir. So, uh, bhakti culture ruled the Indian cultural scene for more than one millennium, from 17th century right up to the beginning of colonialism, and it. took different forms in different places and uh, it spoke in different idioms a great uh, tamil poet manika vasagar who wrote him to shiva in his manika uh, 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 in his shiva purana he says yehanum anehanum adavane kan he is one and he is also many so god is one he also becomes many in divine experience there is no diversity between unity and multiplicity so similarly bhakti which is essentially devotion to god is unique in to different places at times where it emerged at the same time the things common to all bhakti uh, cultures so this one thing we should remember bhakti has taken many forms many guises spoken in many idioms different metaphors but the essence is the same it's like my own uh, sufi master about whom i written a book uh, uh, ashadullah khadri wali shiva yogi used to tell me that the sun is the same everywhere but the sunlight is perceived differently in different places in deserts mountains regions in forests and plains at different parts of the day similarly bhakti is that sun uh, comparable to that universal sun perceived differently in different places and different times uh the bhakti uh, cultures of india are so diverse so rich and the mind boggling diversity makes it impossible for any single scholar to talk about all schools of bhakti because bhakti is spoken in not in one language some people say that bhakti was again sanskrit no bhakti also influenced sanskrit and there are lots of at least some very great bhakti poets in sanskrit like kulashekar alwar of the 6th century who was the emperor of kerala and jayadeva who wrote geeta govinda and uh, acharya utpala acharya utpala deva who wrote shiva stotra in kashmir in 6th century so bhakti even sanskrit could not escape the influence of bhakti mm. and bhakti has spoken not only in 22 major indian languages but also in many other dialects of india 
There's a lot of bhakti literature in Bhojpuri, there's a lot of bhakti literature in Garhwali, there's a lot of bhakti literature in so many tribal languages. So, uh, it has spoken in innumerable languages and uh, nobody knows all the languages of India, so we can't talk about all the bhakti cultures of India. We can at best talk about uh, the, 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 that part of bhakti uh, which is uh, found in the languages accessible to each one of us. Uh, now, uh, briefly, Zolgai Dr. Vail Singh has uh, given some idea of Vachana movement, but let me talk about the background. I said Bhakti began in South India, in Tamil Nadu particularly, and uh, uh, then it traveled upwards towards North India, crossed the Vindhyas, went right up to Kashmir. And uh, one of the ways of describing these mind-boggling uh, bhakti cultures, classifying them, is into regional variations. You can speak of Tamil bhakti, Kannada bhakti, uh, bhakti in Punjab, bhakti in Gujarat, etc. That's one way of doing it. But this doesn't always work because there are lots of crossovers and intersections. Another way is to describe bhakti on the basis of sects. For example, there are some bhakti schools which are devoted to the adoration of Lord Shiva, some of Lord Vishnu, some of divinity without any form, nirguna as they call. For example, consider uh, Sikhism taught by Sikh gurus to be a form of nirguna bhakti, the formless, adoration of the formless. Um, <clears throat> which uh, I think Guru Gobind Singh in his Japu Sahib calls Arupa, Anama, with a nameless and formless divinity. Uh, so, I think one of the most useful ways of classifying bhakti in a comprehensive way is to talk about Saguna and Nirguna bhakti. In all regions of India, you have these two streams of bhakti, Saguna and Nirguna. And what is Saguna? For example, Bhakti, which originated in Tamil Nadu, was essentially Saguna Bhakti. Saguna means worshipping the God as a deity, an anthropomorphic deity. Shiva and Vishnu, Vaishnavism and Shaivism, were the major Saguna Bhakti movements of Tamil Nadu. But later, in around 15th century, Another bhakti tradition started, which was centering around the local Tamil god Murugan, which produced great saints like uh, Arunagiri Nagar and so on. So it is Saguna Bhakti. For example, when you look at North India, you have Tulsidas who, uh, who, who authored Ram Charitmanas. So the Ram that he talks about is Saguna Ram. He is the son of Dasharatha, husband to Sita, he is a Puranic character also. Whereas the Ram that Kabir talks about is Nirguna Ram. There's no name, no form. Uh, and somewhere Kabir says, Atma Jyoti Natelina Bhakti Nishijina Chamakati Jaisa Nirmalumoti. So most of them talk about this formless. It, it, formless doesn't, it has no form. It has, doesn't have the human form. It's compared to a kind of Paran Jyoti, uh, a, 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 a light which is never extinguished. So, Saguna and Nirguna Bhakti. And uh, one of the uh, you know, uh, common uh, points between uh, Vachana, the, the, the faith of Vachanas, which some people call Lingayatism, some people call Vireshaivism, and Sikhism, is that both of them are essentially Nirguna Bhakti, adoration of the formless. For example, in Tamil Shaivism, Shiva is a Puranic character. He has two wives, Parvati and uh, Ganga, and he has this four snake garlands and Damaru and Trishul, etc. But in Bhakti of Karnataka, Shiva Bhakti of Karnataka, Shiva is worshipped not in the human form, in the form of a linga, which is the form of the formless. So if Tamil Nadu is the place of origin of Saguna Bhakti, which travel to different parts of India later, to Gujarat and then to uh, North India. Karnataka is the place of the origin of Nirguna Bhakti, uh, which traveled to 
other places uh, and the culmination of this guna bhakti is this uh, this uh, uh, this great stream of sikhism in north india which integrated the influences of uh, sufism and uh, vedanta and the natha uh, yoga tradition and uh, and bhakti so uh, nirguna bhakti is the common link between uh, vachanas and uh, uh, sikhism uh no uh people with bhakti is basically one's personal experience of the divine is not mediated by a scripture is not mediated by a priest priestly class is not mediated by clergy one to one relationship with god so the let me first uh, uh, the sum up the basic tenets of uh, uh, sharanas for the authors of vachanas they call bigards in english words but i prefer the word sharana sharana means one who has surrendered to the divine according to sharanas there are no scriptures they do not accept any scriptures for the great saints of this uh, 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 tradition and as uh, dr vel singh said there is a 200 no there are more than 250 vachanakaras authors of vachanas who appeared in karnataka between late 11th century and mid 12th century of course the vachana writing continued in later period also up to say, even today there are people write, uh, writing vachanas but the main uh uh the harvest of vachanas happened between the end of the 11th century and the the middle, middle of the 12th century so among the 250 vachanakaras who came from all castes of society for example basavanna who is supposed to be the leader of this vachana movement was a brahmin and allama prabhu who was supposed to be basavanna's guru was the son of a devadasi he belongs to the natura community devadas and basavanna himself as uh, dr vel singh pointed out the, he said madara chenna ya madara chenna kobla was the first which not right? basavanna says do i am a brahmin i consider madara chenna ya the kobla chenna ya as my father don't call me a brahmin he says and there were barbers and washermen and there were uh, doctors uh, farmers stone graves even prostitutes and thieves became vachana poets they were also composed and there were some some of them were kings who gave up their throne to become uh, uh, the 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 sharanas uh, the, the 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 who surrendered themselves to the divine so it was uh, one of the most democratic devotional movements in india which covered all sections of society and as uh, uh, dr wilson said there were 30 more than women poets and the most important women poet was akamha devi who i consider to be the greatest uh, poet in kannada language she has often been compared to meera and laleshwari mati uh, bahina uh, maharashtra but i think akamha devi is a much greater poet than all of them and she is the greatest poet in kannada language and no poet in kannada language has been able to surpass the beauty of her poetry Many poets like that. There are many others. Akhmadi was only one of them. So it was a. And who uh, this uh, Vachana movement began, we don't know. Uh, it was perhaps uh, uh, the and, and majority of Vachana poets came from artisan class. They were cobblers. They were weavers. uh they were uh, 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 you know uh, potters and they were uh, 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 basket makers and so on so these artisans are the backbone of vachana tradition though not all because basavanna who uh, uh, seems to be a central figure to this vachana uh, uh, tradition uh, in the narratives of uh, the later period Uh, was the finance minister of uh, emperor bijara who ruled from uh, uh, kalyana 
which was formerly the imperial uh, capital of Chalukyas, the last imperial capital of Chalukyas, so Bijila belonged to Kalachur, and Basavan now is finance minister. And there were some, some mendicants like Allama Prabhu. Allama Prabhu was a yogi and who was a, like an avaduta, not settled anywhere. And uh, Akamari, for example, was also like an avaduta, and she is one of those nude yoginis of India. She is supposed to have taken off clothes, and uh, because they, 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 she felt that nothing should come between her and God. Like uh, it is also said of Laleshwari in North India, uh, so she walked nude in devotion, which was shocking to her own contemporaries and which uh, many uh, uh, scholars, particularly feminist scholars of uh, our period, find very interesting uh, and fascinating from the uh, yeah, viewpoint of gender politics. Uh, I don't want to mix up bhakti with gender politics, with bhakti which has to be understood in its own right. So what I'm, I'm trying to talk about, the richness and variety of um, the, the, the corpus of vachanas produced by these 250 and odd poets of uh, Karnataka. Uh, according to a legend, and I'm saying this is according to the legend, all the major Vachana poets came together in Kalyana when Basavanna was the uh, finance minister of Bijara, and he set up a hall of divine experience called Anubhava Mantapa, an assembly of saints where the saints came together and debated spiritual bad matters and they composed vachanas in dialogue with each other. And some of the vachanas have this, uh, uh, the internal evidence shows that it was they were composed in the context of a dialogue among the, this, this kind of assembly, but not all of them. And uh, according to the legend, again, uh, uh, the followers of uh, uh, this vachana tradition they defied caste system. Uh, they married an untouchable boy to a Brahmin girl. Both of them were devotees of Shiva. And this uh, 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 this uh, uh, enraged the powers that be. And this led to a lot of violence. And uh, the violence against the Sharanas, the followers of this uh, tradition, and who, who had to with uh, a, a, the run, who had to flee Kalyana and they built another uh, uh, center, devotional center, in a place called Ulevi, which is in uh, uh, the forest area of North Karnataka today. Uh, and uh, there's a temple of uh, which is the, devoted to uh, one of the saints of uh, this uh, Sharana woman, Chandabhasaveshwara, who was the, uh, the brother in law of uh, Basaveshwara who was supposed to have been the leader of this uh, movement. So it was a movement, it was a culture, uh, which seems to have had a very short life. These people came from different backgrounds. They tried to unite uh, on a common uh, the ground of shared beliefs and practices. Uh, but it was not yet a settled philosophy. It was not, it was a sect. This word sect is very important when you try to understand the uh, uh, bhakti and the siddha movements of India. They were not caste. For example, the loss of Nathapanthiyas in India. So Nathapanthiya could be from any caste. They're Aghoris, for example, they're from any caste. So caste is one thing, but sect is another. So it originally started as a sect, sect of Sharanas. And later, after the, the, the end of this... Um, uh, uh, this uh, golden period of Vachanas in the 12th century, uh, the, the, because of the violence unleashed against the followers by the establishment, they had to go underground and they had to fight the powers that be, like Guru Govind Singh had to, and uh, they survived. But in the around the 15th century, they got the royal patronage in Vijayanagara uh, period by the great Vijayanagara king, Prabhupada Devaraya I of the Salva dynasty. And this was a time when these Vachana texts, which were in oral transmission. So from the 11th century onwards, these Vachanas were still in the oral transmission. 
only during this period of consolidation. It's called uh, Sangopana Yuga in Kannada, period of consolidation of Vachanas. These texts were compiled by different scholars. And this is also the period when uh, they started writing the philosophy of Vachanas and they tried to interpret Vachanas in the light of Vedanta. So uh, uh, what was uh, uh, the, the expression of the intense personal experience of the divine by uh, uh, common people uh, was turned into a kind of esoteric philosophy. Uh, so it became institutionalized after 15th century. And the followers of which now meant they uh, froze into a caste who are called Lingayats and, or Vinishayvas. There's a debate about which is the proper nomenclature today. Uh, but uh, that should not be. There's no one to one correspondence between uh, the, the Vachana, uh, Sharanas who wrote Vachanas, and this community, uh, uh, though they claim this heritage because uh, Vachana uh, was the uh, expression of people from all castes, irrespective of caste. Uh, irrespective of gender or, or social position. Now, what is the vachana? Uh, see, the word vachana uh, in Sanskrit has different meanings. Uh, normally, in the champu kavya in Sanskrit, champu kavya consists of verse passages and prose passages. Prose is called vachana. Vachana also means speech, but different bhakti movements of India produced different expressions, you know. Uh, can you hear me? Different yeah, expressions, uh, different, different forms of uh, 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 expression. Uh, for example, in uh, uh, Maharashtra, saints of Maharashtra produced two forms, Ovi and Abhang. Something Manish was started Ovi and uh, 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 Santukaram Abhang. So in uh, Marathi, they say Oviancha, Nanoba, uh, Abhangancha, Tuka. And uh, uh, in Kashmir, for example, Dalleshwari uh, used the form called Vak, Lalla Vak. So it has different names. Uh, uh, in, uh, the the Vaishnavic saints of Karnataka compose kirtanas, which is compositions in praise of Lord Vishnu. So different bhakti cultures have different literary expressions, and vachana, these sharanas are called their expression vachana. And what did they mean by vachana? Uh, some people were translated vachana they consider this to be a prose poem. This is not proper because prose poem is a genre which came in, in the context of modern poetry. There's no need to confuse vachanas with prose poem, uh, which appeared in the West and which came to us. Neither do we need to confuse the word vachana with the prose passages in Champu Kavya. Gardhya, it's not even that. Thai vachana, they meant this. And one of the Greatest exponents of Vachana period, Basavanna tells us what is the essence of Vachana. Now, I always argued that in Sanskrit there was a great school of poetics. Great uh, politicians like Ananda Vardhana, Abhinav Gupta, etc., tried to figure out what makes up poetry, what is the poeticality of poetry. In South India, in the Tamil tradition, the great uh, Tamil text called Kapiyam, also tried to figure out what are the components of poetry, what makes poetry happen. And Vachana Karas, Vachana poets, have a poetics different from Sanskrit poetics or Tamil poetics. And what is it? Now, so Basavana, they said, when you speak, you have to speak very clearly. When you speak, you should mean what you say. When you speak, it should something that match, matches with your actions. So says Basavanna in one of the Vachanas, Nudidare muttira haradam tirabeku. If you speak, your words should be like a string of pearls. It should be beautiful. In Sanskrit also they said, 
good words in good order. This is how poetry is defined. Nuri dara buttina aradan tira deku. Nuri dara spatikala shalake yam tira deku. It should be sharp like a needle, clear like a crystal. It should be like crystal needle. Crystal clear, needle sharp. Nuri dara buttina aradan tira deku. Nuri dara spatikala shalake yam tira deku. Nuri dara manikkira dipti yam tira deku. It should be the like the glow of ruby in sanskrit also uh, sanskrit poetry they talk about kanta guna prasad guna of poetry the pleasing aspect of poetry is like a glow duri dara makya dipti antara beku and then this duri dara linga mechi ahuda ho dena be so when you linga is the embodiment of shiva i said vachana kala do not worship shiva predominantly as saguna with the human form but as abstract linga nirguna so nirguna shiva linga vachi he should be please and say yes quite so quite so but he says even this is not enough he should be clear sharp transparent pleasing and pleasing to the lord not to, not only to human beings pleasing to the lord but even more important is nuri yora gahaki nari nidare Kodal singer man in the way, nigga. Unless my words do not match with my actions, how will Kodal singer man, which is Basavanda's name for Lord Shiva, be pleased? So, the test of a vachana, the litmus test of a vachana, is not just it's a beautiful expression. It's not even that it's a truthful expression, but it should be. the expression of one's own actions that is is talking walking one's own talk it's not just talking and not walking talking the walk uh, in present day english we can say this is the essence of vachana this is the essence of vachana politics and elsewhere basavanna himself talks about uh, in a different context talks about uh, his vachanas in one vachana he says wo je bajavane nadi bhakti poetry is not very structured poetry it's not rule bound it's spontaneous basavanna says wo je banavare i don't know the laws of rhythms and beats brahma gana rudra gana vanariye i do not know the metrical feet in poetry there are different kinds of meter chandas is i don't know wo je banavare Paramana sadhi sava nariye. I don't know where to pause, where to continue. Kuraal sadhi sava, oh Lord, nida ke keel lavagi because nothing can be taken away from you. Aano vadi dum theori will. I can sing as I please because whatever I say against you, I can't harm you because you are beyond harm. You are beyond any defect. You are beyond any blemish. So I have the freedom. to sing as i so two values that vachana poetics emphasizes what is the match between words and actions and expression which is free plus it is not reciting the scriptures it's not following the rituals they condemn people who blindly follow read the scriptures and uh follow the rituals uh which is completely irrational for example basavanna says in one of his vachanas uh, see there are so many snake temples all over india snake worship is a very common uh, part of indian uh, uh, religious practices basavanna says in one of his vachanas kalla nagara kandare halanere varu these people what they do is they go to a stone snake And offer it, give it the offering of milk. The general nagara can do that. Over there, yeah. When the real snake comes, they run away. Unna ra linga ke boda wani kuvel, and they also condemn linga worship in the temple. These people go and offer rice to linga, stone linga, which does not eat it. Unuva jenga ma bandhe na riyam bariya. 
And when a mendicant, holy mendicant, Jangama comes and asks for all, he says, get away, get away. This is what kind of faith is this? And he also condemns idolatry. He says, Avasara Bandare Maharuva Devara Madintu Mudaniya. People worship uh, the images of uh, deities made of silver and gold. But when they become bankrupt, when they have no money, I don't, they don't mind selling these uh, golden statues. So how can I worship these gods who can be sold when one goes bankrupt? So it's not ideal. <laughs> temple. See, temple was the center of Bhakti poetry in Tamil Nadu. Because when the Tamil Bhakti poets is in the temple, the temples were very simple institutions. But by 10th century, temple became the center of upper caste culture, which was God. I think temples became commercial centers, business centers. Uh, there was, and the, 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 it, they became little empires. So, Dvachana poets rejected the temple. Allama Prabhu, uh, Basavandas Guru, Guru of uh, many Vachanakaras, says in one of his Vachanas, look, when the temple came, God ran away. When the yeah. temple came, God ran away. And, and Basavanda himself says in one of Vachanas, Ullavaru Shivalaya Maduvaru. The rich people build Shiva temples. Nani Namadeva Badevaniya, O Father, what can I do? I'm a poor man. In the Shirave, uh, uh, in the Shirave Karasha, my head is the pinnacle of the temple. Deva Devula, my body is the temple. Kale Stambhava, and my legs are the pillars. Oh Lord, Stavarak Kari Vuntu Jangamakari. The people think that they can make you permanence to God by building these permanent uh, structures, like temples, statues, etc. But all of them are subject to erosion in time. What, what they think is stable, what they think is still, will come to an end. Jagamakkari Villa, that body temple has no end. One body goes, another body comes, and the spirit continues in body after body after body. So body, human body, is the eternal temple of the divine. Yeah. So, and about the scriptures also they said, Veda, Vedas, they get to the Vedas failed because they could not make you understand. Puran, they get to Puranas failed because they could not complete. Agama, Arilar, they get to Agamas failed because they could not understand. Shastra, sorry, says the Ketu. Shastras failed, scriptures failed because they could not demonstrate. So all scriptures fail you. So what is the scripture? The only scripture is one stone personal experience of the divine. It's, the, it's in the temple of the heart. It's in one stone breath, in one stone body. So the in, in, in internalization of the divine uh, is a very important aspect of Nirguna Bhakti movement uh, as uh, uh, it is of uh, uh, Sharana culture of Karnataka, which is expressed in, in, in the Vachanas. And one more important thing, emphasis in the Vachanas, as I said, Vachanas have such rich diversity, I can't talk about all the dimensions of them, but I've talked about what Vachana means, and the, the basic spiritual principle is the authenticity of one's words and action, and the, the authenticity of one's personal experience, and the one another important uh, uh, emphasis in Vachanas, uh, which uh, I, I have not found in any other Bhakti school of India, is the emphasis on Kayaka. Kayaka is manual labor. As I said, majority of Vachana poets were from the artisan class. Artisans are those who make things with their hands, who do labor, perform labor for their livelihood. And 
a lot of uh, uh, spiritual uh, uh, seekers in India uh, had used to abandon their family and their, their social calling uh, to follow, follow the spiritual path. For example, it is said that during Buddha's time, uh, a lot of uh, young people would become monks and uh, there would be no soldiers uh, to raise the army. And then the kings and uh, came and represented to Buddha, and then Buddha stopped uh, the soldiers from, from becoming uh, monks for some time. So this was a pattern. Anybody who wants to become very spiritual has to give up his family, uh, abandon his wife and children, and go into spirituality. Vachana poets did not preach this kind of bhakti, and it was not against women. They said that they know Siddharama, one of the Vachana poets. From Sholapur, which is Maharashtra, uh, he says, Hindu Mari Allah, woman is not evil. Hindu Rakshasi Allah, woman is not a monstrous. Hindu Teksha Channa Siddha Malika She is the embodiment of Lord Shiva. Don't, don't insult or call her names, he says. And Allah Prabhu, another person says, Hindu Maya, Maru Hindu Maya Allah. They say that woman is Maya, she is not Maya. Hindu Maya, Maru Hindu Maya Allah. They say wealth is Maya, no wealth is not Maya. Mandu Maya, Maru Mandu Maya Allah. They say land is Maya, no land is Maya. Manada Mundara Asaye Maya Kana Gogeshwara. If none of these things constitute Maya, what is Maya is the lust in one's mind. Desire in one's mind. So this is the source of Maya. So Vachana poets did not turn their back to the worldly life. That's why they believe in the not in just in the dignity of labor, but in the sanctity of labor. Uh, for example, there is a, a poet called Thurugahi Ramanna, Ramanna the cowherd. In one of his Vachanas, he says, Astamanadali Brahmana Kave. Madhyanadali, Vishnuva Kave, Uvaktu Muruvali, Rudrana Kave, Katala Daga, Inti Govagara, Kati Kati, Yi Yena, Kaya, Yi Kolo, Yendu Karevudo Ramanata. He compares his daily routine of herding cattle to the cosmic actions. He says, In the morning, thy uh, uh, heard the uh, cattle as if they are Brahma, the three, of the three trinity. And in the afternoon, I heard Vishnu. In the evening, Rudra. And at night, I put them back into their uh, uh, places, stable, and then I ask you, O oh Lord, when will you rid me? of this cowherd stick which I am carrying in my hand. So look at this. The ordinary act of herding cattle becomes a kind of meditation, a kind of divine ritual for uh, this uh, great saint poet, Turuga Hiramanda, Ramanda, the, uh, uh, the, the, the cowherd. And uh, I can... Uh, um, I want to read some other uh, poems of this nature, where work becomes uh, the, the embodiment of uh, uh, labor. Uh, see, this is uh, Madhara Chanaya, uh, the first poet, uh, who was the pioneer, the father of Vaishnava tradition, Chanaya the Kavya. Uh, he talks about how uh, the way he makes a sandal, the actual process of making a chappal, that becomes an act of worshipful. That becomes a spiritual experience for him. So I read one of his words translated by me. After erecting three pillars, the gross, the subtle, and the causal bodies, after beating the buffalo's rough hide, after removing the flesh with the staff of the manifest and the hidden, after tanning the hide 
with the fi fiber of dualism. After pouring the caustic juice of quintessence into the height pouch of awareness, the blemishes of the soul thus destroyed have come to make the sandals for his feet. Take care not of the ground below, but of the path your feet and sandals take. Do not be enslaved by the hand doll, blade, peg, but realize Rama Rama, your own true self, the joy of choice. So he is a God in the cobbler who works with his hand doll, his blade, his peg. He says, to do it for your livelihood, but do not become enslaved. Seek the divine through your labor. There's another vachana by another cobbler for it, Dhuyaya. Uh, he said, when he is stitching a sandal, he sees Lord Shiva at the tip of his knee. Then he says, on seeing the great Godhead appear on the edge of the chisel, the edge of the chisel, piercing the high, I said, why are you here, sir? In front of the one that moves about carrying the bag of flesh, Go, go away to the dwelling place of your devotees. Free them with your... Free them. Go on to the top of a silver mountain with your masquerades. Go free your devotees. By the grace of the master of lust, dust and smoke, go and prosper. He says, when I'm doing the labor, this is the sacred act, this is my worship, this is my God. It says, even to God, go away. Don't disturb me. So this is the esteem with, in which uh, these uh, great uh, 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 the artisan uh, poets uh, held uh, their labor. For example, there was somebody who was a clown, who was a roadside clown, Marikande, who was also a poet. Uh, he says, no, let me talk about Marikande, the burglar, was a burglar, was a burglar. Later he became a saint. He considers this act of burgling, robbing, uh, as also a spiritual uh, 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 experience. For the master of the picklock, I slaughtered a goat, sacrificed a monkey, dedicated my mother, my father. If, in spite of all this, the thing stolen does not come to me lovingly, I declare, Lord of Mara, the love god, the foe of Mara, does not exist. So I do this labor, and what I seek, it should come to me, otherwise God doesn't take it. So the, 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 the proof of the pudding is in the eating of it. So if you have spiritual experience, you know. It's the personal experience. And some of the vachanas describe this uh, uh, personal experience in ecstatic tones. And they talk about Herasari, Nimatheja, Herasari, Kambali, Allah Prabhu said, Shatakoti Surya Rudisam Tirtudaya. It was like the rise of a million thousand suns. So many mistakes, particularly Nirguna Prabhu talks about, talk about this light. Sufis call it Noor. Some people call it Paranjyoti. And Guru Nanak's famous Arti is there, where he talks about this Jyoti, the inner light. So, Chatakoti Surya is a And it was like the lightning creeper. Vinchina Baliya Kandante Adeya. Kogeshwara. You have, I have no metaphors to describe you. So, another definition of Vachanas is speaking of the unspeakable, talking about the untalkable. So the divine is beyond all the expressions, but we are actually trying to express a part of it which comes into our experience. In fact, in an anthology of Vachanas, which was uh, uh, compiled in around 15th century called Shunya Sampadmi, which is the form of dialogue with Allama Prabhu, the great gurus of uh, for these Vachana poets and other contemporary saints, there is an important discussion between Allama Prabhu and a woman saint a vachana poet called Muktayaka about the speech. When Alama Prabhu is preaching the truth to her, 
Uplayaka said, what the hell are you doing? How can you do this? Because my brother never spoke. If you know the truth, you should not speak about it. Allah Prabhu said, if that's not the case. He says, uh, Sharanu, the Sharana of the Lord Shiva devotee, Nudidare Nirvachani, even if he speaks, he's not speaking. Nadidare Nirgamani, he says, you speak with the self-knowledge, experience of the self, whatever you say becomes the truth. If you speak, if you forget yourself, every one of your expression is a big lie. So the test is not whether you speak or not, whether you speak the truth, and the truth is not the objective truth, it is the truth of subjective Realization this is the essence, this is the soul, this is the quintessence of Vachanas, which Vachana poets expressed in so many forms, in so many idioms, because they were, came from a diverse backgrounds. So to give you a taste of its diversity, I'll read some the translation of two, three Vachanas, and with that I conclude. And then if you have any questions, I'll answer that. Uh, I spoke about... Uh, the one of the earliest Vachana poets was uh, uh, this uh, uh, Dasimaya, uh, the weaver. Uh, he says, You put inside the tree hollow slow fire that does not burn. You put into milk the ghee that does not show. Where was the ghee? It was in the milk. But unless you churn and heat the butter, you don't get it. So you put into milk the ghee that does not show. You put into the body the soul that is not seen. I marvel at the ways of your composition. How you compose the world. Your composition is the whole world. Oh, Ramanatha. This is by Dasimaya, the weaver was also uh, uh, one of the Basavanda's ancestors in Vajna tradition. And uh, they, Vajna poets always expose hypocrisy, moral hypocrisy of people. And Basavanda was a great observer of uh, uh, human hypocrisy in society and a great expert in exposing them. This is a very funny poem. He's talking about a snake charmer. In this poem, a snake charmer and his wife, who's broken most, they are going to on the way to find a bride for their son. On the way, from the opposite direction, they see another snake charmer with a broken nose wife, who are also going to find a bride for his. Uh, their son. The first snake charmer, when looks at the other charmer, is broken nose wife, forgetting that he himself is a snake charmer, he himself is broken. He said, No, this is a bad woman, let's go back. So, this is the hypocrisy. He says, Look at this. The snake charmer and his broken nose wife, snake in their hands, go to check omens for the son's wedding. They exclaim, Bad woman, that's not. On the road, another snake charmer and his broken nose wife. Broken nose, one's own wife. Snakes in one's own hands too. Himself, broken nose. Blind to one's own, what shall I call such a curve? Blind to one's own faults, yet calling others' names. Oh, Kurava Sangamadeva. And another important emphasis in Vachinav poets is the rejection of caste system, which was the basis of economy in those period. So Basavanna says in one of the earth is one and the same for the Paraya street and the Shiva temple. Water is one and the same for washing shit and for ritual cleaning. All costs are one for a man with self-knowledge. Salvation is the fruit Salvation's fruit is one and the same for all six systems of knowledge. Truth is one 
Oh, Master Kurel Sangama, for the one who knows you. So I said, this is the essence of all bhakti, Saguna and Nirguna, that like the sun is the same all over the world, who manifests himself in different forms, in different hues, uh, in different uh, intensity, different places at different times of the day or the year. Bhakti also expresses the glow of divine uh, in these different forms. And Vachanapas have also captured the glow of the divine in so many ways. And I we, uh, should complete with uh, one Vachana by Akamahadevi, two Vachana short ones. Uh, because one of the uh, uh, important aspects of Bhakti Munit all over India with the expression is a devotion of love, divine love. Where they talk about uh, Bhakti in terms of human love, but it's about devotional love. So Akama Devi, uh, she abandoned her uh, uh, king husband. Her husband was a king and she became a nude walking mendicant. She went in search of Lord Shiva and it is said that she uh, found her heaven in, uh, uh, in a, a dense forest area in the Sri Shailam, which is a mountain sacred to Shiva in South India, in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, that's her uh, old life story and the uh, life story. But in Vachanas, she describes her internal journey. I'm going to read a couple of them. Akuma Devi says to Shiva, she calls Shiva Chandamalikarjuna. Chandamalikarjuna is a deity of the temple of Sri Shaila, Malikarjuna, uh, which is one of the Jyotil, 12 Jyotilikas of India. He says, when in passion, do what you like, O Master. When in passion, cut off the locks, O Master. When in passion, bite off the fingers, Master. O Master Chandamalikarjuna, heap miseries on me if I ever grumble in pain. One of the conditions of bhakti is that bhakti has no conditions. People have asked me so many times, never have lectured in bhakti, what's the difference between being religious and being a bhakti? I said, you can be religious without being a bhakti. In all religions, there are hymns. When we pray to God, whether in primitive religion or advanced religion, we do that for some kind of return. God, give me this, give me that. But bhakti is not asking for anything. Bhakti is not utilitarian. It's an yang in itself. Uh, and um, uh, uh, Akwari also talks about it. Uh, she says, uh, if, uh, the, uh, you shower uh, charcoal and burning charcoal on me, I say it's the sacred bath for me. And if you uh, when I go for begging, you the uh, 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 a loaf of bread I get as an arm, if it falls down on the earth and a dog takes it away, even that I consider your blessing. Even if you kill me, I say I go down to you. She says one of the vachanas. And uh, in one of her most beautiful vachanas, which I translated, she takes leave of the world. And with this vachana, I conclude my speech on vachanas. I could go on, but uh, don't be the constraints of time. This is the last vachana I'm going to read. You hunger, stand still, stand still. You thirst, stand still, stand still. You delusion, stand still, stand still. You lust, stand still, stand still. You intoxication, stand still, stand still. You pride, you hate, stand still, stand still. All of you, still and moving, stand still, stand still. I'm carrying an urgent letter to my Lord, Janna Malikarjuna, goodbye. Right. So, was Akama Devi, this farewell to the world, uh, this which now I can do my uh, brief. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, uh there's one doubt. Uh, uh, that 
in number north india and the pagtas which are part of guru granth sahib uh, or, or, or if we can talk about all the guru sahiban of guru sikh gurus uh, i think that uh, this all uh, north indian bhakti that that's nirguna bhakti mm-hmm. is reactionary to that uh, uh, all came in the reaction of that uh, sarguna bhakti sarguna mm-hmm. bhakti ke reaction mein hi aa rahi hai और उसमें भी उस, उसमें आ रही है कि बेशक के गुरु नानक कहते हैं कि निर्गुण आप yes. सरगुण भी आप निर्गुण वही सरगुण भी वही वो दोनों को मानने को तैयार हैं बट जो है ना जैसे आई थिंक आई एम रॉन्ग टू से दैट इट इज रिएक्शन टू दी सरगुणा भक्ति रिएक्शन टू दी जो है एरोगेंस ऑफ ब्राह्मणवाद एंड फ्रेटिक इस्लामिक रूलर्स the northern indian bhakti is like that ki it is against the arrogance of brahmanvad and that's why they i think they that that's why uh, they choose the way of uh, nirgun formless uh, yes. bhakti uh, is, is it like uh, that in kannada also that vachana uh, sahit is yes is a very very good comment that, to the, the very good yeah. comment and a very good question a very important yeah. question bhakti yeah yeah okay. uh, i never said nirgun is a reaction against something else yeah because divine can appear in the form and in the formless yeah it's just right yeah in one of his abhanga sukaram says when i was uh, i looked at you you were standing in a form of a, a, a beautiful young man with tulsi mala he says to krishna when i turned back and, and i again tried to look at you it disappeared So God can be nirguna and saguna, both depending on one's uh, uh, relationship with the divine. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, as you said, in North India, Sikhism uh, was uh, it was not a reaction; it was trying to defend itself from the attacks of fanatics, fanatic Islamic rulers yeah. and uh, yeah. critical uh, priestly craft. Uh, in the context of bhakti in Karnataka. uh there was only hypocritical uh, uh, religions it's not just not religions themselves but the followers of those religions jainism was there and tantra was there tantra was very popular in india and uh, so temple worship was there uh but vachana poets find this hypocritical you give half of food to a non living linga when a medical human being comes you say get lost so this is this hypocrisy so it's also against hypocrisy and uh, one of the important uh, uh, virtues of nirguna bhakti is that see the vachanakaras when they look at their signature lines they have the names of different temple deities they were the worshipers of those temples in different places but they were all divided so they have to evolve something that is common to all of them and this linga worship worship of the shiva linga made with the human hand which is given by a guru that became the common object of worship of everybody so nirguna bhakti has the strength to unite people from different religious and sectarian backgrounds so uh, i i think nirguna bhakti appears uh, mostly in cities because in big cities uh because kalyana was a big city where artisans came from different uh, places and they were looking for a common spiritual platform so this yeah. it provides a broader platform and this came uh, to in my seekers. this came to my mind because all uh, the you said that all uh, vachana uh, vachana writers were uh, from labor class vachana said most, most, most of them i said most 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 of them were from yeah. labor class and and when when labor class is uh, coming to this side i think when they were not allowed to enter the temples that when there was due to manusmriti yes in north in north india this is to the reaction of manusmriti due to manusmriti is that division of society these bhaktas came and they spoke all against that uh, uh, division of society yes 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 
So this kind of kaash hiraki uh, uh, appears to have become solidified during the 12th oh, century. Oh, oh, oh. Krishna poets right. do not pay any any respect for caste system. That's why they said yeah. it's first one I said is what you know. You are the Arava, you are the Arava, you are the Arava. Don't make me ask who is he, where did he come from? Yeah. Right, right. You are the Dhammava, you are the Dhammava. Make me say he's ours, he's ours, he's ours. So everybody of us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hey, Prof. Sir, Jadhi, you joined us? Dr. Sir? Yes, and I tried to send an email. I'm sorry. Yes, and we missed him. No problem. So no I have problem. a small, small comment to make. Now, Vachana yeah. Sayat is so close to Sikhism. And I'm sorry, I remain ignorant myself. I was transformed to a different world by your lecture. How come there's no sort of mention about this great literature in South in Sikh tradition? Uh, this question, I think, baffles me. I mean, whatever Guru Nanak said, I mean, these same teachings uh, are so close to Guru Nanak. It seems that Guru Nanak was influenced by this uh, this philosophy also. No, uh, Guru Nanak I, was influenced by this philosophy. Uh, yes, in a way, in a way, yes. It, it, because it, it, the influence of Shah. Influence of Sharana sent to Maharashtra. Yeah. So, Namdev and Gdanidev was a, basically a Nirguna Bhakta. Yeah. And uh, Gdaneshwar. And his disciples, Namdev, after uh, Namdev was tortured into death by the upper caste people, Namdev went to Punjab. Yeah, he stayed in Punjab for 14 years. Long 14 he years. He stayed in Punjab. He learned Punjabi. He made composition. So, yeah. this influence of Sharanas through Maharashtra, through Gnandi, through Namde, went to reach North India. And where, of course, it was one of the streams. It was it came together with other streams like Sufism and Vedanta and Nath Sampradaya, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Became, that that that, that uh, was we are finding the connections between that is what, what we were we were yeah, we are trying yeah. to find connections between uh, this uh, our side and uh, that uh, South India. Yeah, there might be some connections. Be, there, there should be at least uh, uh, a good selection of Vachanas translated into Punjabi. Yeah. And a selection of uh, a representative passage of Sikhism translated into Kannada. And they should be published yeah. together in Kannada and also in English. Yeah. Like the, 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 the uh, values and the principles shared between Sikhism and the right. uh, uh, of Karnataka. Right, right. Sir, you have to help us to locate a person. To, who to my mind, you are the right person. Locate some selected hymns from Punjabi, maybe with English translations or Hindi translations into Kannad. Sir, there was one pro Professor Shepar Kas in uh, Hyderabad. Shiv Kumar. He was he Kumar. Shiv, Professor Shiv Kurpash was some he was vice chancellor of some central university. Uh -huh. Professor Shiv Kumar. He was he is a Punjabi fellow. He knows Punjabi. Shiv Kumar. Shiv Kumar. Do you know him? Yeah, Shiv Kumar. Professor Shiv Kumar. Yeah, he is an English poet. I know him. Can can he help us? He is English poet, but he's he's basically he's Punjabi. I know, I know, I know. I know. Basically he's he basically he's from Punjab. Can he, he be was, helpful to translate from uh, from both way? No, he doesn't know Kannada. He doesn't know Kannada. That anyone who knows Kannada, uh, who who is Punjabi and knows yeah, Kannada, do you do you know anyone? <laughs> there is Can you find out someone? There is somebody who is very old, Chiranjeevi Singh, who was the chief. Huh. Yeah, he, but but he, he will so not. He can't do it. He can't do it. He can't do it. Too old. Okay. He can't he do can it. Do it. So I think it has, to, it has to be one person can't do it. It has to be a collaboration between somebody who knows Kannada very well and with somebody who knows Punjabi scriptures very well and who can communicate with each other in Hindi and English. 
two scholars. Yeah, yeah. We, can, we can have then one workshop of three, four Punjabi uh, translators and three, four yeah. Kannada translators. That's a wonderful idea. That's how it works. That, from workshop, we can produce something. Very yes. Yeah. For example, I got uh, Vachanas translated into Tamil, Malayalam and uh, Telugu in yeah. a translation workshop. I yeah. got uh, three poets from these languages and yeah. three Kannada poets. I was the director of this workshop intervened between them and then these works were published in all the three languages and uh, sold very well also. I think similar uh, uh, exercise can be done between uh, uh, yeah, I, have, I have done in a Konkani to Punjabi. Uh -huh. we, we, we translated some Konkani poetry into Punjabi and some Punjabi poetry into Konkani. And uh, that, that this, by this uh, formula, we, we invited some Konkani poets to Patiala and we yeah. were some three, four Punjabi uh, people in Punjabi. And we, we mm -hmm. uh, done it together. They were going mm -hmm. doing Konkani, we were doing Punjabi and we were sitting. We, we know Hindi, yes. we know Hindi. Yes. Through, so through Hindi or English, we can, we can help it. Yes. Yeah. Workshop, so is workshop is the only way to do it. That's, That's the only, the only way. way. Collab workshop, collaboration through workshop. One person can yeah. do it. We need, your guidance. we need your guidance. First of all, we need, this. we need Corona to be over soon so that we can physically meet because yeah, yeah. Let us well, we can also think of uh, publishing this uh, by English translation of uh, Japu Sahib. Ah, uh, very good. In the, I, uh, it, I, in those days, I, there was no computer when I translated it. So somebody has uh, uh, typed it and I have a printout. I'll get it typed some by somebody. So I make a soft copy to you. And uh, because I found this a very great work, uh, the way. The, the very recitation of uh, Japu Sahib itself creates so much divine energy. Yeah. There is like a mantra, every word is like a mantra, all the mantra. 